Well, good morning to everyone. Oh, you hear the gunk in my throat. Uh, it is so good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Uh, I am Dorado Rubel Abel, the worship leader and director of music ministries here at Spring Valley United Methodist Church. Uh, once again, it is a pleasure and it's an honor as always to see you here in space, in this place. Also, if you are here or online, once again, thank you for making Spring Valley United Methodist Church a place to be for this morning's worship experience. Yes, sir. That's right, Derb. That's right. Fist pump. That's exactly right. Uh, there's a lot of young folks in front of me and uh, I may need to take a picture of this like sometime in the bank. I ain't trying to do anything with my phone right now, but it's so good to see you youth and children from Words Camp uh, and parents that, that pulled them to be here. Thank you so much. We appreciate it very much. Uh, for those that are in the pews, please uh, get the green card in front of you or behind you and register your attendance so that way we know you are here. And also, please make sure to fill out any prayer requests that you may have. As I always say, if it's a little or not so little prayer, every prayer counts, okay? Uh, as you have just heard a few minutes ago, I want to introduce uh, Joey Tullis, who is on violin. Uh, obviously, he'll be here with us here this morning. So, yes, of course. Thank you. And then we've got some special things happening with commissioning of the, of the youth, preparing for the UM Army uh, mission trip, and then we have our kids from Worship Arts Camp who have done a wonderful job. Uh, you probably can't tell how tired I am, but I'm faking it right now. So once we finish here, I'm going to knock myself out for about 15 days, all right? Uh, the, the kids are energetic, but I realize that I'm not that young anymore, so... Uh, I need that as much sleep possible. <laughs> That's exactly right, Craig. <laughs> At this time, let us pray. <laughs> Dear Lord, thanks so much for allowing us to be here this morning. Uh, after the that we have had, whether we were at work, whether we are here at church, uh, we just thank you for allowing us to be here at this time, at this present moment. Uh, we allow, uh, allow us to be able to open our hearts to open our minds and free our souls to use, for you are our sole provider, and we give you the utmost praise unashamed. It is these things that we pray ever and ever more. Amen. And at this time, folks, please let's stand and we'll sing our quick hymn medley. <laughs>
times. Please be seated. Uh, at this time, we're going to have the children from the Worship Arts Camp come up. Uh, and as they are coming up, I just want to mention uh, how exciting it was during this week. And as I mentioned, uh, how much it wore me out. It was a blast uh, using all of my energy with these, uh, with these kiddos. Uh, and with our other directors as well, Bridget did music, I did drama, uh, Julia did choreography, uh, and Mary Beth, who could not be here, also did choreography. Uh, she's battling a stomach bug right now, so please pray for her. Um, but it was a joy just to see the kids memorize lines and music basically in four days. Uh, and it was a lot. And uh, they worked hard. So if we could just give them uh, a round of applause for their hard work. Uh, at this time, they will be singing uh, the final song from the musical, uh, Not So Very Ordinary Day. Oh, they did wonderful, didn't they? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. And at this time, folks, I know it's a kind of uh, usual from the break, but I will uh, please al uh, allow yourselves to please stand and greet one another and exchange the peace of Christ.
everybody. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, my name is Pastor Frank, and uh, it's a great day to come together for worship. I want to say, echo Dorado's comments. Thanks to everybody who helped make Worship Arts Camp such a joy for our young people. Uh, it was great to see their performance the other night. And now we're ready to commission our youth group. They're going on mission trip. Uh, as soon as we fit up worship here, uh, they'll be going to Austin. And so I'm gonna invite them to come and stand. And then uh, any family or anybody who just super duper loves young people and wants to come and support, I wanna call you forward uh, to come and kind of circle around. Um, if you don't want forward, that's fine. You can also stay there and you might lift up your hands as a way of, of conferring your blessing upon them as well. So we are commissioning them. Look at this group. Isn't it amazing? Look at this group. There's going to be, I think, five or six churches. Nine, nine churches, like I said, uh, gathered together in Austin. And we're the biggest church that's coming. Look at that. How amazing is that? Yeah. All right. Dear friends, as we take part in this celebration of blessing and commissioning, we are relive, reliving a practice of the early church. We read in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit set apart Saul and Barnabas for the work of mission. And the church at Antioch, after fasting and praying, laid hands on them and sent them out. The early church eagerly sent its members to other peoples to assist those who were already of the household of faith and those who did not yet believe in Christ. Today, we also send our sisters and brothers to serve the needs of the church in Austin and around the in, in that community. This commissioning and sending will strengthen the bonds we maintain with the faith-filled communities to which they are going. And the prayers we offer are an expression of the ties that bind us together in the larger body of Christ. So our commissioning order is going to be up on the screens. And I will start it. There will be a congregational response. So be on the lookout for that. Dear friends, today we recognize the ministry of our students and these adults, and we commission them to a special task in the service of Jesus Christ, serving this week at UM Army in Austin. In the name of this congregation, I commission you to this work and pledge to you our prayers, encouragement, and support. May the Holy Spirit guide and strengthen you that in this and in all things, you may do God's will in the service of Jesus Christ. And we all say together, Almighty God, look with favor upon these persons who today reaffirm their commitment to follow Christ and serve in his name. Give them courage, patience, and vision, and strengthen us all our Christian vocation and witness to the world and of service to others through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Go be awesome. Not yet, though. Don't go yet. We continue now in the spirit of prayer, extending our pastor our time of praying from commissioning to uh, the broader needs of the congregation and the world. And so as we pray this morning, uh, we will begin with a time of silence. And this is a time for each of us to lift up our own, our own lives, our own needs, our own concerns before the Lord and pray for God to be a part of that. Of course, God knows what's on our hearts already. But prayer is an invitation for God to become a part of what's going on and for us to recognize God's role. So as we pray in the silence, I invite you to listen for God's voice. The voice of God that says, you are my beloved child with whom I'm well pleased. 
And then I will lead us in a prayer, and then we'll close our time of prayer with the Lord's Prayer. So let us enter now into the silence and join together in the ministry of prayer. Lord, you have heard our prayers this morning as we have prayed for our young people and adults as they are prepared to go and serve in your name. We pray that that those who are receiving the gift of their work this week may be blessed to know that it is a gift of love and that our students and adults come forward to bring them a sample of your great love for the world. We come together today, Lord, to remember the heart of Jesus Christ, who though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor and dwelt among us. Jesus, who was content to be subject to his parents, the child of a poor couple's home. Jesus, who lived for 30 years the common life, earning his living with his own hands and declining no humble tasks, whom the people heard gladly, for Jesus understood their ways. May this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. We remember Jesus was mighty indeed, healing the sick and the disordered, using for others the power he would not invoke for himself, who refused to force people's allegiance, who was master and lord to his disciples, yet was among them as their companion and as one served whose desire was to do the will of God who sent him. May this mind be in us, who was in Christ Jesus. We remember Jesus who loved people yet retired from them to pray, rose a great while before day, watched through the night, stayed in the wilderness, went up into a mountain, sought a garden who when he would help a tempted disciple, prayed for him, who prayed for the forgiveness of those who rejected him and for the perfecting of those who received him, who observed the traditions but defied convention that did not serve the purposes of God, who hated the sins of pride and selfishness, of cruelty and impurity. May this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. We remember Jesus who believed in people and never despaired of them, who through all disappointment never lost heart, who disregarded his own comfort and convenience and thought first of others' needs. And though he suffered long, was always kind. Who, when he was reviled, uttered no harsh word in return. And when he suffered, did not threaten retaliation. Who humbled himself and carried obedience to the point of death, even death on a cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him. O Christ, our only Savior, so come to dwell in us that we may go forth with the light of your hope in our eyes, with your faith and love in our hearts. And now we unite our voices in prayer that Christ may dwell in our hearts, remembering when asked, Jesus taught us, 
When we pray, we should say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, the glory forever. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will see of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other I know you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God. All right. Uh, thank you for that, Dorada. It's beautiful. Uh, we're continuing our sermon series that we're calling Swimming Through Mark, kind of a summer Bible study. Um, and uh, this week's especially appropriate thinking about swimming because Jesus is crossing over a lake. Last week we were on the lake. We're back by the lake again this week. Uh, so Mark 5, 21 through 43. If you want to read along with me in a Bible that you brought with you or on your phone, it'll also be up there on the screen. Uh, this is uh, the, the theological term for this kind of thing in Mark is an oreo. So 
It starts with one story, there's another story in the middle, and then it finishes the first story. And there's the, these things all the way through Mark. Um, by the way, if you don't know, I've been producing a, a, a weekly Bible study online that goes out on my YouTube and the church's YouTube and it's Facebook on Mondays at 11. So y'all can tune into that and hear more uh, from a different perspective on the same text. Anyway, here we are, Mark 5, 21. Listen for God's word. Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee again, and on the other side, a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Jairus, one of the synagogue leaders, came forward. When Jairus saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleaded with him, my daughter is about to die. Please come and place your hands on her so that she can be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A swarm of people were following Jesus, crowding in on him. This is the middle part of the Oreo. A woman was there who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a lot under the care of many doctors and had spent everything she had without getting any better. In fact, she had gotten worse. But because she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. She was thinking, if I just touch his clothes, we healed. Her bleeding stopped immediately and she sensed in her body that her illness had been healed. At that very moment, Jesus recognized, this is kind of funny, Jesus recognized that power had gone out from him. And Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples, always ready to say something really wise, don't you see the crowd (laughs) pressing in on you? Who isn't touching you? But Jesus looked around carefully to see who had done it. And the woman, full of fear and trembling, came forward. Knowing what had happened to her, she fell down in front of Jesus and told him the whole truth. And he responded, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, healed from your deeds. While Jesus was still speaking with her, messengers came from the synagogue leader's house. Other Oreo. We're back to the cookie part. And they said to Jairus, your daughter has died. It's time to stop bothering the teacher. But Jesus overheard their report and said to the synagogue leader, don't be afraid. Just keep on trusting. He didn't allow anyone to follow him except for Peter, James, and John, James' brother. They came to the synagogue leader's house, and he saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly, and went in and said to them, what's all this commotion and crying about? The child is dead. She's only sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he threw them out. And then taking the child's parents and his disciples with him, those three, Peter, James, and John, they went into the bedroom and taking her hand, Jesus said to the child, Talitha, which means, young woman, get up. And suddenly, The young woman got up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. They were shocked. Yeah, sure. He gave them strict orders that no one should know what had happened. And then Jesus told them, give her something to eat. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray.
God, as we begin our sermon time this morning, open our ears and our hearts to the message that your Holy Spirit would have for us to take home today. We thank you for the inspiration we're already feeling from the music and the performance of our children and the dedication of our young people for mission. Lord, we know that you're already active here. And so be with us now as we listen and learn and grow in faith. Lord, I pray that as I keep this morning, your word may be heard through me, if not because of me, then in spite of me. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, 2012. Anybody remember that year, 2012? That was 12 years ago. Uh, I, I didn't remember a whole lot about my life in 2012, and so I went to where my life was recorded, Facebook.com, and I searched 2012. What was going on in Pastor Frank's life, 2012? Uh, well, that was the year. Chris and I were just living down the road a little bit, and we had been living in this guy's house, this landlord house, and it was a terrible experience living in that person's house. 2012 was the year that we were liberated from that person's house. She shared that on Facebook in 2012. Uh, let's see, what else happened in 2012? Linus was four. He's 16 now. Miles was, how old are you? You're 19. He was seven. <laughs> so these two guys who are now six feet or so, were like the size of these kiddos that sang up here earlier in 2012. I went and looked at uh, big events that happened in 2012. Let's see. Uh, Barack Obama was reelected in 2012. That was a big thing. Uh, there was that really unusual hurricane that hit New York City. Do y'all remember that? That was 2012. Um, let's see, what happened? Oh, entertainment. Uh, that was somewhere that The Dark Knight Rises came out. And the first Avengers movie came out in 2012. Yeah. A lot of stuff was going on in 2012. Why am I thinking about 12 years ago? Because 12 years is what the women in this story have in common. One of them was alive for 12 years. The other one had been sick for 12 years. And so as we come into this little Oro story, let's think about 12 years on both sides. Jairus, the synagogue leader, I mean, we would know this, maybe that was his first child, maybe that was his only child, maybe it was his fifth child, who knows? But 12 years before, he had become a parent to that child. And now 12 years later, she's fallen seriously ill. And this synagogue leader who wasn't a disciple of Jesus, wasn't a follower of Jesus, but had heard what Jesus was doing in the neighborhood, in the community, went to the teacher and said, I know if you come to my house, you can heal my daughter who's fallen ill and near death. Just think about that, 12 years between her birth and now facing death, the journey that that father had been on. And now this other woman, this is one of the great stories of faith that's in the scriptures. And how ironic that Mark remembered the name of the synagogue leader, but not the name of this great woman of faith. This woman who for 12 years Twelve years ago, she had been healthy. Twelve years ago, she was part of a family and a community. Twelve years ago, she went to worship every week. She taught Sunday school. Uh, she had a job. She had an income. But over the next twelve years, she had lost everything. She had been to all the doctors, all the healers. I, I told you last week, the disciples weren't shocked that Jesus could heal people because there were other healers around. They're shocked that he could control the weather. That's a big thing. But see, she knows about healers. 
Because she's been to all of them. She's maxed out her insurance. She's been to every medic clinic, every hospital, every faith healer, every Whole Foods grocery store on that aisle where they have all the stuff. And none of it had helped. Y'all know anybody like that? Who's been ill and sick and has done all the things you're supposed to do to get treatment and help and it's not coming? Matter of fact, it's worse. She'd been through it all. She was desperate. We're not told what her disease was, but we're told it involved blood. And that means that ritually she was unclean. So no one would touch her. Can you imagine? 12 years not being touched by your children or the people in your Sunday school class. The people you raised your kids with at soccer games and stuff, 12 years, just all that gone. Can you imagine the fear that she lived in just trying to go out in public and not touch anybody because everyone knew she was the sick person and they would all just be like, as much as they can to stay away from her, not make contact with her so that they wouldn't become unclean themselves. Just think about that. For 12 years, this is her life. But, like Jairus, she heard about Jesus coming through town and what he had done for others. Perhaps he could help her. No, not, not, not perhaps. I know he could help me. But to save him face and embarrassment, I'm not going to approach him. I'm not going to talk to him. I'm not going to do anything. If I just touch his garment, not his hand, I'm not asking him to do anything. If I just touch this little thread that's sticking out here under his sleeve, just touch this little thing, I believe I'll be healed. Think about that just for a moment. I mean, that is faith, right? If I just do this tiny little thing, reach out, and t it's kind of like, um, pickpockets at the train station. Like they always tell you, look out for your, when you get off the train, look out for your stuff, keep it in your pockets. It's like she's trying to steal pickpocket Jesus, but not money, healing power. If I can just kind of creep up behind, I'm in this massive crowd, nobody can see me. I get anonymous, I'm safe in, in a way in here, and just, just touch him a little bit. And she does that, and Mark tells immediately, she knows that she's been healed. She is in touch with her body. She knows. She feels it. And then at the same moment, Jesus, also in touch with his body, feels this power going out from him. And yet there are all these people who touched me. <laughs> We're all touching you. What are you talking about? We're trying to get people to stop touching you. No, who touched me? Somebody touched me. And the woman, I mean... The courage, because she just broke like 18 rules. We don't speak to rabbis in public. Women who are ill don't speak to men in public. They certainly don't touch them. She could have just escaped, hidden herself in the crowd and got out the way she came in. But she hears Jesus calling for her and she comes forward and falls at his feet. And then this amazing thing happens. She doesn't ask Jesus for anything. But he says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Be healed of your disease. You see that little, little tiny thing there? Mark didn't remember her name. But what did Jesus refer to as daughter? The woman who had been cast out from her family, who had been part of a community in 12 years, in 12 years, Jesus brings her back into the family. This is a daughter of God. Daughter, your faith has made you well. And it's not like her healing came when Jesus said that, because we're told, She'd already been healed. 
Jesus is proclaiming to the congregation gathered there, the crowd, this woman is restored. Health, physically, absolutely. But also, socially, also, spiritually, she is now part of the community. And, and Jesus is announcing it, pulling out a little bullhorn thing. Her faith has made her well. It's time to stop excluding people. This story is all about, it's a couple of things, but there's one thing that's kind of the, the dangers of fundamentalism. When, when religion becomes a list of rules to follow, we end up hurting people that we're called to bless. When we exclude people because of their ill or their poor or they live over there or they speak that thing or they do this thing or they do that thing, we aren't living into the fullness of the love of God. Yeah? Jesus doesn't ask her to fill out any forms. He doesn't ask her to join the church. He doesn't give her a pledge card. None of that stuff. Yeah? Matter of fact, Jesus doesn't do anything except be available to her touch. And this is the other part of the story that I love. Is that it involves physical contact. Jairus says to Jesus, if you will just come and touch my daughter, she will be made well. By the way, the little girl near death, also ritually unclean, touching a body forbidden by the law. Jesus shows up at the house though, not worried about the rules. I told you he's a disruptor. He's disrupting norms. He shows up at the house and there's, there's this group of people that are out there. And these aren't like the relatives in the family reunion. These are professional mourners. Think about that for a moment. What, what a job, right? You, you learn on Facebook Live that this person down the street has died. And so your job is to go there and perform at mourning for them. Can you just think about that for a second? They're playing flutes, singing songs. They're mourning for an absolute strength. And so when Jesus shows up and says, the world, she's not died, she's only fallen asleep, what else would they do? They would laugh at him. They're not connected to this family at all. But Jesus comes in to the room. And what does Jesus do? Taking her by the hand. He sweetly says two little tiny words. Talitha kum, which means little girl, young woman, get up. And she stands up. Physical touch, it's important, y'all. It's important to hold someone's hand when they're hurting or to give a, you know, kind of an appropriate level of hug. Physical touch, is, it's comforting, it's important. For me, that's one of the hardest parts of the, of the pandemic is for like for eight months, we couldn't greet each other, we couldn't hug, we couldn't share physical touch with people. That was really hard for a lot of people. A lot of people were really fired when we started sharing the peace again in worship. Some, some people said, you know, I'm an introvert, that means I'm comfortable, I don't like to, and I'm an introvert too, I, I, I totally understand that. But it's also important because people tell you if you listen closely enough, you'll hear every now and then, it's the only time I receive physical touch from anyone during the week is that moment on Sunday morning. The only time. That connection is, is vital. The woman reaches and touches Jesus' clothing. Jesus reaches and touches the girl's hand and healing power comes out in both of those instances. Uh, these are both great examples of daughters of faith, of what can happen when we open ourselves up to God's love that is so powerful that it can overcome any challenge that we're facing. And this faith is embodied in the life of Jairus, didn't even know Jesus, wasn't even a follower of Jesus, but was convinced that Jesus could help. 
And this faith is embodied in this woman, this anonymous woman, known only for her illness and her bleeding, but whose faith compelled her to just touch and receive God's blessing. So I would love to have shown up and worship the following Sunday. And I imagine this woman standing up and sharing her story with people who had excluded her for 12 years. This is what God has done in my life. The great thing about UM Army or any mission trip is the storytelling at the end. Or next Sunday, they'll be here again and they'll be sharing some of what they done, what they did this week. It's in the storytelling that you really connect with how Christ is at work in their lives and the life of the community that they're blessing this week. So make it a point to come to worship next week to support them in their sharing. But also let's think about how is God touching each of us in our life? How are we receiving that loving touch from Christ? And then how can we begin to tell that story so that others may come to that love of Christ in their life? Twelve years. Twelve years ago. So much has changed over those twelve years. So much in my life, so much in your life has changed in those twelve years. Jairus' life changed over 12 years just having this girl in his life. The woman's life changed 12 years just dealing with this illness. But now, an encounter of divine love, both of their lives go in a new direction. Empowered by God's love. Saved by God's love. And now living in love for others. May, may it be so for us. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we respond to God's word this morning by sharing of our tithes and offerings. We know many of us have already given throughout the week for the church, and so thank you for doing that. Uh, some of us give here in this moment, and we also appreciate that gift as it helps us to share the gospel with more people. And so as our ushers come, let's join together in prayer. Lord God, you are the healer, you are the lover, you are the one who loves each of us. And so we pray that as we have enjoyed your love this morning, been touched by the Spirit, that you'll bless us as we share this morning, that more people may come to know that love as we do. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray and give. Amen.
And at this time, as we uh, finish our experience, I invite you, uh, if you'd like to look along in the hymnal, it's hymn number 266, Hear Us Emmanuel, Hear Our Prayer. This hymn goes directly in line with uh, Pastor Frank's sermon. Uh, so what we'll do first is John will play through it once, and then we've got five times to try to get it right, okay? There's five verses. Yes, we are doing all five. Please do not hate me afterwards. So once again, we will sing the final hymn, 266, Hear Us Emmanuel, Hear Our Prayer. So what a great service. It was so great to have our kids singing and our youth commissioned. Now it's time for us to go out. They're on their way to Austin. We're on our way to live our lives. All of us carrying the love of Jesus with us. And so go forth and may our lives reflect what we believe, that God loves us, that God loves all people, and God has called us to share the good news and the love of God with others. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.